And uh, I would like to say thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Evan Wiener for about to give us this uh, opening day, this lecture on baseball in American culture. Um, already one of the games of a New York team has been canceled. So I think this will be, as you were saying, a season like no other. But uh, sometimes looking back will help us look forward. So with that, Evan, I'd like for you to take it away. Well, thank you, Linda, for inviting me. And uh, I kind of grew up probably about two and a half miles from uh, where the library is. Uh, go back down to the Dairy Queen, make a left, go up about a mile and a half, and that's where I lived, right over the New York border. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner, and uh, I've been doing this kind of thing since 1971. Uh, I was at Spring Valley High School, which is about five miles from where you are right now. And I was in 11th grade. And uh, I had a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio. This is 1971. And he says, you have a good voice. How would you like to uh, be on radio? And I said, I want to be on radio in the worst way. And I was. Uh, we had a high school show. Um, and our high school is called Tiger, the Tigers, Spring Valley Tigers. And uh, we were on WRKL, which was easily accessible where you are, Upper Saddle River. And um, Joe used to call me student, and I'm still dealing with him nearly 50 years later, and he still calls me student. Uh, Joe uh, opened the doors for me in radio and also with the Nyack Journal News, which I did some work for while I was in high school, and uh, the Hackensack Record, the Bergen Record. Um, and I had three stints there, one in 71, one after college in 1979, and I came back there at the turn of the century to write op-ed pieces for Peter Grad over at the Bergen Record. Now, that guy there, that guy there, he might look familiar to you. Um, he was, uh, he is an iconic uh, figure in American history. Uh, he's been quoted bef in arguments before the Supreme Court more than anybody else in United States history. And that goes back to the uh, 18th century. Uh, that is, of course, Lawrence Peter Barrett. And uh, I had a relationship with him. Uh, I spoke at his museum uh, twice a year. And after every talk, he came to virtually every one of my talks. And uh, after every one of them, he'd pat me on the back, say, good job, kid, good job, kid. Want some tuna fish? We got some in the back. Um, Yogi is a major part of uh, the baseball's greatest or golden era, which was the 1950s. Seems like he was on TV a lot, not just as a baseball player, but as a commercial uh, pitch man. Uh, and Yogi lasted 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 21st century. His last commercial, of course, was for Affleck. Uh, the culture of baseball, Yogi is right in the middle of that. In 1954, the height of Yogi's career, the French philosopher, a guy by the name of Jacques Barzan, and uh, there's a book, uh, Essays by Jacques Barzan, uh, uh, noted, whoever wanted to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball. And Barzan, who is from France, said that the best way to learn it, don't go to a major league game, go to a high school game, go to a, to a sandlot, watch little kids play, or go to a minor league game then you get to really see how baseball operates and how people uh, deal with baseball. Uh, baseball, hmm, that's Casey at the bat. Casey at the bat. Um, Casey at the bat. In 1964, 1965, I was at PS 151. And uh, that's in Woodside, Queens. And I had a teacher by the name of Miss Alexander who we thought was 132 years old, but she was probably in her 60s. And she gave us an assignment. And the assignment was pretty simple. Analyze Casey at the bat. So here I am, I'm eight years old, you know, and I'm looking and I read the poem. There's no joy in Mudville for the mighty Casey struck out. So, hey, he's a lousy baseball player. He's a lousy baseball player. That's what he is. He can't hit. Comes up in a clutch situation and he strikes out and the team loses the game. And Miss Alexander said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. I said, I don't understand why. It's a lousy player struck out. She said, no, it's all about man's failures. Now, I don't know if Casey at the bat today is part of any curriculum. Uh, I know there was a woman when I was speaking down in Westfield, New Jersey, who's a teacher who says every, who said every spring training, she was an elementary school teacher, she made sure everybody read Casey at the bat. So who is Casey and why does he have any significance? Well, Ernest Thayer was a columnist with the San Francisco Examiner between 1886 and 1888. 
I wrote a couple op-ed pieces for the San Francisco Examiner in 2001, so I guess I have something in common with Thayer, except he was a columnist in the 19th century and me in the 21st century. Casey was printed, the poem Casey was printed on June 3rd, 1888, and there's no author's credit. Thayer didn't take any credit for it, but he would about uh, seven years later, he would go back to a Harvard class reunion and he would read the poem and finally, hey, he's proud of this thing. Uh, and with good reason, because this thing is percolated all over the country, San Francisco, of course, being a very small community back uh, in 1888. And the reason why the poem becomes famous, well, this guy, the Wolf Hopper. Some of you who are old enough might remember his daughter, Heather Hopper, who was a gossip columnist uh, in the 1960s and uh, always on talk shows. And um, she was an actress before she was a gossip columnist. Well, this guy was a vaudevillian. And somehow he gets his hands on Casey at the Bat. You know, obviously there's no internet in 1888. San Francisco is kind of a lone outpost out in the middle of nowhere compared to the rest of the United States uh, out uh, by the Pacific Ocean. So somewhere, somehow, uh, Hopper gets a hold of this poem and he likes it. He really, really likes it. And he figures out, hey, I could do something with this. I could put it on the vaudeville stage and I could act it out. And he does for the first time on August 14, 1888. Uh, it is estimated that Hopper performed this poem more than 10,000 times in his career, which spanned from the late 1880s, as far as Casey goes, until about 1922, 1923. Uh, and for about 35 years, he kept performing Casey at the bat, and Casey at the bat, and it never changed. Casey was still a lousy player. He struck out. Uh, who was Casey? Uh, Thayer didn't say very much about Casey. He said very little about the poem. Uh, it could be King Con Kelly. He played uh, baseball in New England, where Thayer was from back in the 1880s, or it could be Stockton, California, claims that it's based on a player who played in Stockton back, into the, uh, back in the 1880s. Uh, Casey has never been identified, but uh, Casey uh, is pretty famous, uh, not because of Thayer, but because of other people. Uh, that is the Springfield, New Jersey Library. And uh, I was doing a talk there on the Super Bowl about two years ago for Debbie, who runs the library. And uh, there's a room in the library, and it's the Springfield Historic Room. And the stuff that's in the room they got uh, from the belongings of a hermit in town who passed away, who had apparently no relatives, and he kind of collected a lot of stuff. And you go into that uh, reading room or, or the museum at the Springfield, New Jersey Library, and you'll see all kinds of stuff like that thing. That thing has a cylinder in it. And the thing that's crossed, that's pointing to three o'clock, well, that's kind of the needles We're on the phonograph record, which young people have no idea. Most young people have no idea what phonograph record. But anyway, uh, it's that arm, and you put the cylinder in, you crank it up, and this thing actually works because Debbie cranked it up for me, and it plays, and it plays, and it plays. And if you had one of those at home, uh, you could listen to this guy, Russell Hunting. Uh, he was a voice actor, and he was the guy who decided, hey, Casey is doing, Hopper's doing well with it. I'm going to put it to cylinder and it's going to be heard places. So Russell Hunting, he was an entertainer, and he was a sound recordist, and he recorded both uh, twice in 1893 and again in 1898. And because it was Casey, I guess he felt he should be using a heavy Irish brogue. In 1905, John Kaiser recorded it down the Menlo Park for Thomas Edison. Uh, the Hopper version was recorded for Victor before it became RCA Victor with Nipper the dog and his master's voice. That didn't come out until 1906. But, but if you had one of those devices, uh, and this is uh, up in Sagway, uh, Quebec, this is from October of 2019, when I used to be able to go on cruise ships, I'd speak on cruise ships and I'd find these obscure places like this guy's garage. Literally, this guy's garage is loaded with antiques. And one of the antiques is that old Victrola that you just crank it up, you throw your record down, 
and you could have heard the Kaiser version of that or the, the Edison version of it or, or the Hopper version of it for Victor um, in your home with one of those things. So Casey was really well known at the turn of the century. Hopper would commit the first to a film. He was the first one to do that. It was an early short subject. Uh, Lee DeForest was the producer. That was 1929. Uh, Wallace Beery starred in the 1927 version of the film. Uh, Bob Hope, for those of you who remember Bob Hope and his ensemble, Bob Hope's second banana, the comedian Jerry Colonna is the guy with the big mustache, if you remember those days. Well, I do because I kind of watched reruns on TV uh, in the early 1960s. Anyway, uh, he recorded a rendition for Disney, and that became the basis for a 1946 Disney cartoon called Casey at the Bat. Jackie Gleason performed it on his television show in the 1950s. Uh, Johnny Bench and Tug McGraw and others, others being George M. Steinbrenner III and Billy Martin, uh, voiced the poem in an orchestral setting. Uh, George and Billy did it to raise money for the Tampa PBA. Um, does that sign mean anything to you? And by the way, if you want to say something, just type it into the chat and uh, I will get around to it uh, as quickly as you type it in. So if you have any comments or any questions as we go, feel free. Uh, does that sign mean anything to you? Ball game today at the Polo Grounds. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, no, maybe. I'll give you a second or two if you want to type something in. If not, I'll go ahead. Ball game today at the Polo Grounds. Looks like kind of a sign you would see on the New York City subway, right? Yeah, next to Dr. Zinmore, Zinmore and his zit removal plan, because I think all of those, oh, we got somebody here, so let's let's take a look at the, the comment uh, here. Uh, the Giants, you're absolutely right, the Giants, but it's more than just the Giants. Uh, there's a songwriter by the name of Jack, Jack Norwood, and he's on the subway, and he's looking up, and he's looking up, and he's looking up, and he sees ball game today. And he starts thinking, and he starts thinking, and he starts thinking. Hmm, ball game today. Man, I think I could do something with that. So he goes uh, to wherever he's going, and he uh, hooks up with another songwriter by the name of Albert Von Tilzer. And he says, uh, I'm thinking about uh, the sign I saw, ball game today at the Polo Grounds. And he and Von Tilzer sit down and start to write a song. And the song, which is made famous for another generation of people by Harry Carey, Wrigley Field in the middle of the seventh inning, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. I worked with Harry in 1994. Not an easy guy to work with. Uh, but um, it's a Chicago Wrigley Field tradition. Um, during the middle of the seventh inning, they bring somebody in to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. It's got to be sung poorly because Harry sung it poorly, and it's got to be sung with, you know, with that intent in mind. You're singing it poorly, you're having a great day at the stadium, win or lose. Now, let's talk a little bit about the song. Now, the song actually has a preamble, it has a middle, and it has an end. Uh, the preamble is basically, um, there's this woman named Katie Casey, we think she's from either Lower Manhattan or Brooklyn, because that's where the subway would go. And um, we think she's Irish. And uh, she gets, she has either a date or she's going with a friend or whatever she's doing. It's probably a boyfriend. And baseball games started at three o'clock in the afternoon in those days, um, which is 1927 Yankees were known as five o'clock lightning because they seemed to win games around the seventh inning. Uh, in 1927, which would be about five o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, so she and her boyfriend or her friend or her brother or her father, whoever it was, uh, they're going back and forth and they're going back and forth. What should we do today? And she says, you know, I want to go to a baseball game. Nah, I'm not. Well, I want to go to the baseball game. I really want to go to the baseball game. No, I'm not interested. I really want to go to the baseball game. Finally, she can't deal with it anymore. And she yells, Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I ever get back for we will root, root, root for the home team. They don't win. It's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Now, there is another verse to this song. 
it's um, about how Katie Casey knows how to get the players going. She um, knows all the players. Now, the players didn't wear numbers, didn't have names on the back, but she knows how to get them going. For some reason, she gets them going. We don't know if she ever went to the baseball game with this guy. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the background or possible background of the song. Neither uh, Norworth nor Van Tilzer ever saw a baseball game. Norworth, girl, his girlfriend, he broke up with by this point. However, she may have been a suffragette. Uh, apparently, in his writings, he talks about how she was an early day women's liberation type person. Uh, in 1908, uh, women didn't go to baseball games. Baseball players were considered thugs, ruffians, villains. You know, they weren't good people. And uh, a proper woman would never be caught at a baseball game, at least. That was the thinking back in 1908. Um, so he had this girlfriend, and he may have been inspired by this girlfriend to write this song. Uh, two years ago in the Washington Post, there was an op-ed piece talking about how Take Me Out to the Ball Game may have been the first women's liberation song ever, ever, because it is a woman who is the central character of this song, and she's yelling, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Uh, the song would become famous on the vaudeville stage because of Norwood's new wife. His new wife is named Nora Bays, and she popularizes the song along with Shine On Harvest Moon. Uh, and this is in 1908. We are now 113 years later, and you tell me which is the more popular song, so, uh, in, at least in the United States and baseball playing countries, Shine On Harvest Moon or Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which is played virtually every day in North America, uh, in Canada, in Mexico, and in the United States at baseball games. Um, and uh, it's out there. It is out there. Uh, Norwith and Von Tilzer are in the uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, Norwith did see a baseball game in 1928. Von Tilzer went to his first baseball game in 1940. Um, oddly enough, baseball never embraced the song. It wouldn't be until 1934 at the World Series between the Detroit Tigers and the St. Louis Cardinals that the song would be first played at a Major League Baseball park. Um, it was in the movies, Groucho Marx, Night at the Opera. Um, this is the story where Groucho's in charge of an opera and he and Margaret Dumont go over to Italy to find the world's greatest tenor. Of course, Groucho runs into Chico and Harpo and uh, they have a friend who they say is the world's greatest tenor. They sneak their stowaways on the boat. They come to New York. Uh, and eventually they got to get to the opera house and they got to kill some time because the real guy that Margaret Dumont had has to be knocked down. And the other guy has to be put up, uh, up on stage, get dressed, put up on stage. And uh, to kill some time, uh, Harpo and Chico get some sheet music and they go down to the pit and they put sheet music in front of all the musicians. They're playing the aria from uh, the, the opera and uh, it all of a sudden comes, becomes, take me out to the ball game. And Groucho jumps down and he's selling peanuts and Cracker Jacks to the crowd. Uh, Harpo Marx would return to the song on an I Love Lucy episode in 1955. Uh, the song has been played in numerous movies, numerous TV shows, numerous radio shows. Um, it's the anthem of baseball, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Who's on first? What's on second? That's uh, Patterson, New Jersey's own Lou Costello. And he is with Bud Abbott. And they are about ready to perform the routine, which I don't think today is all that popular, except if you're a certain age like I am, who knows who's on first, or you're a fanatical baseball fan that goes back into baseball history. Um, who's on first? What's on second? Is a vaudeville burlesque type act um and it basically it's called rounders and the game of baseball to come evolved out of the game called rounders and basically the act is this i have a lot of comedian friends and i have a famous actor who's a cousin of mine named jerry stiller who i talked a little bit later on in this uh 
in this little talk. Anyway, uh, I have two friends, John Joseph and Max Docelli. They perform uh, on cruise ships. And John does a musical takeoff on this, uh, on Who's On First, based on the rock group Who. And um, so anyway, the basic thing is they go around in circles. They go round and round in circles. You got the straight man, the guy who is not taking any gruff, which is in this case, Bud Abbott. And you got the idiot, basically, who is Lou Costello. And uh, it basically goes something like this. Um, Lou Costello is meeting somebody from the St. Louis Wolves, and uh, he wants to ask about the players on the Wolves. And he says, uh, who's your first baseman? And Abbott says, who? He says, that's who I'm asking. Who's your first baseman? So you can see the rounders going round and round and round and round. Uh, who? Who? Who do you pay? At the when they get their paycheck, who, and it goes round and round and round. Baseball may have started. Well, the first I don't I can't say it may have started in the United States in 1792. But uh, I go up to the Berkshires every summer and I speak in Pittsfield. And my wife has a cousin who has a place up there. And we went up to North Adams, uh, Massachusetts, by the Vermont border a couple of years ago because there's a neat little art museum up there and across the street from the art museum is a Berkshire's baseball museum and they honor Jack Chesborough who is a baseball hall of famer who came from that area and won 41 games for the New York Highlanders uh, the predecessor of the New York Yankees in 1904 and Jeff Reardon came from there and there was this little thing it says baseball B-A-S-C capital B-A-L-L um, played in 1792, and they talked about how it was played there in 1792, which means the game had to be imported from England, which means it came out of um, rounders. Uh, it was a type of American uh, classic, uh, who's on first was uh, a vaudeville act or burlesque act, uh, common style. Now here's the question, did Michael Musto write this? Well, he's generally given credit uh, for writing this routine. Uh, but uh, he never perfected it. And the question always has been, did Abbott and Costello pay Michael Musto 15 bucks for the routine? Because comedians give routines away when they know that they're, they're gone. I mean, I get no respect. Rodney Dangerfield, a guy by the name of George Schultz, uh, retired from the road, opened up a comedy club in Brooklyn, uh, and told Rodney, you know, take it, take it. I get no respect. And of course, Rodney ran with it. So things like that happen all the time in, in comedy. And this is back in the burlesque vaudeville days. John Joseph said, of course, they paid 15 bucks for uh, the routine. But uh, Max Docelli told me, he said, we're comedians. We steal all the time, like Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis was up in the Catskills absorbing all the uh, comedians. And he probably stole 90% of his act or their acts. And he just did it better. And Abin Costello just did it better than Michael Musto. Um, but it becomes an American classic. Now, they get this thing around 1936. And it's a baseball burlesque vaudeville routine. Uh, it's been suggested, although never verified, that Bud Abbott, when he got onto the board, so to speak, uh, in vaudeville and burlesque in the late 1920s, he was the money collector who went up on uh, stage, uh, did some version of, of this kind of, of this routine. But then again, Rounders was a very popular, very well-known routine uh, for comedians back then. Uh, he meets Costello on the burlesque circuit, and they get a hold of this. And uh, this is around 1936, and then they begin to going around the country to perfect it. Uh, Costello's writer, John Grant, might have thrown in some, some of the routine, along with Will Glickman, who is a longtime writer, who was even writing in the 1960s, Car 54, Where Are You? And so they get a shot on the Kate Smith radio show on CBS uh, as bit players on the show, but it's the Kate Smith show, one of the most popular shows on radio at that time. And in March of 1938, they unleash this on the country and Abbott and Costello blast off the launching pad to become mega stars. They performed it at the White House. They performed it in the movies, on radio and TV for the White House, for FDR, for Truman, for Eisenhower. And uh, by 1956, the Baseball Hall of Fame is noticing and Abbott and Costello are the first outsiders ever to be quote-unquote enshrined in Baseball's Hall of Fame. There's a little exhibit, who's on first. 
uh, they um, could do it for a minute, they could do it for 10 minutes. Uh, the loop in um, Cooperstown um, is about a four minute loop and it just goes round and round and round and round. Meanwhile, oh, about 15 years ago, Vin Scully, the Los Angeles Dodgers announcer who started in Brooklyn in 1950, and he's looking at the TV monitor, and uh, he sees this picture on the TV monitor, and Vinny takes a closer look, and it's who? And Vinny says, now we know the answer to the eternal question of who's on first. Ladies and gentlemen, there is who. Who was a Dodger player? He was from South Korea, and who was on first? There was a what as well. He played with the Washington team in the 1920s before this routine took off. So we know who's on first, what's on second. But I guarantee you, there'll never be a player called, I don't give a darn, third base. A couple of years ago, now almost four years ago, my wife and I went up to Hyde Park uh, because I needed to talk to Franklin Roosevelt about a few things as we got an Olympics coming up this year. And I wanted to know why he allowed the American team to go to Berlin to uh, participate in the 1936 Berlin or Hitler games and uh, legit legitimize the regime. Uh, and I also wanted to know, he, I do a TV talk about, uh, well, hey, you know, you were the first guy on TV in the United States. Were you scared? Uh, about being on TV. Uh, and also, why'd you allow baseball to continue after Pearl Harbor Day on December 7th, 1941? I must say that Franklin and Eleanor were gracious hosts. Uh, a little stiff, but yeah, yeah, those things happen. And yeah, they offered us books. It was a little hard to turn the pages, but I got my answers. I got my answers to all three. Uh, Roosevelt uh, felt that uh, the athlete should represent America in 1936. Uh, and in 1939, hey, he had been in front of radios, giving fireside chats in front of crowds, TV, piece of cake, and the red light, le uh, rather the green light letter on uh, in 1942. The commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, writes a letter after Pearl Harbor to Franklin Roosevelt and says, what are we supposed to do? Uh, in 1918, which is also the year the Spanish flu hit the United States, in 1918, uh, the baseball season was cut short because of World War I. Uh, the American League said, we, we, we want to wrap this up by September 1st. The National League said, no, we want to play all the games. Um, and um, it was a good thing the American League, although they did shorten the season, but it was a good thing that the American League uh, said, yeah, we'll, we'll play the World Series because the Boston Red Sox, led by Babe Ruth, setting a consecutive inning, consecutive scoreless inning streak behind the left pitching arm of Babe Ruth, beat the Chicago Cubs in the World Series. Um, but the season was shortened, and Landis said, you know, what are we supposed to do? We don't know what to do. So Roosevelt sends a letter. It's called the Green Light Letter. And he says, I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. Baseball provides a recreation which doesn't last over two, two and a half hours. And Roosevelt's been dead for nearly 76 years, so he's never watched a late Red Sox Yankee game. And uh, which could be gotten for very little cost. Uh, 80 bucks for bleacher seats today at Yankee Stadium for game one. Uh, but, you know, Roosevelt in his his economic strategy, he could afford it. And incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. Uh, although you could do that uh, in the western part of the eastern time zone without any problem starting game at 7 o'clock because it doesn't get dark till 9.30 in Detroit. Baseball and the movies. They're going to put me in the movies. Babe Ruth, they put him in the movies 10 times. A silent movie after his first year with the Yankees. Heading Home stars the babe as a baseball star. Gee, typecasting. He starred in another typecasted movie called Babe Comes Home. 1927 silent movie. There was no print that survived because the way prints were made in those days, unless you took extreme care with them, they disintegrated. Uh, he also appeared in a Harold Lloyd silent movie, 1928, called Speedy. And he portrays himself. He's signing autographs for kids. Harold Lloyd's driving a cab. Take me to the stadium. 
And it was the longest cab ride that uh, Babe Ruth ever had in the movies. Ruth altogether was in 10 movies, from Heading Home to The Pride of the Yankees, the Lou Gehrig story. But the first real star in uh, acting that came out of baseball was this guy on the left, Mike Donlan. He played with the New York Giants, and he was a pretty good baseball player. He's known as the baseball idol of Manhattan. He was a career 333 hitter. He took multiple breaks from the game to perform on stage and in vaudeville because you could make money on stage and in vaudeville. You couldn't make any money in baseball. He retired for good in 1914, went right into the movies, and, oh, yeah, he took his manager with him, John J. McGraw, who did a little acting himself. And uh, they were in a movie uh, – baseball movie right off the bat. Uh, it is estimated that uh, Mike Donlan did appear in 53 movies, but we don't really know that. Uh, and some of those movies probably disintegrated. And some of those movies were probably shot in the Fort Lee Library parking lot, where they have all those little signs about how Fort Lee was once the movie capital of the world. Uh, Lou Gehrig was in the movie. Uh, he was uh, in a thing called Rawhide in 1938. It's a terrible movie. Absolutely terrible, terrible movie. But it served a purpose because um, he's diagnosed with the ALS in 1939. And the doctors have at least a reference point where they could look back at how Gehrig was walking, uh, how he was using his arms, how he was turning. Uh, when he does this movie in 1937, 1938. So this movie does have a purpose in the sense that they can measure how quickly the ALS took over Gehrig's body. The funny thing about Gehrig and, uh, and Ruth, uh, both were important to medical, um, to medicine in terms of watching Gehrig deteriorate. And also Ruth, because he smoked, uh, had throat cancer. And Ruth was one of the first people in the United States in 1947 to receive chemotherapy. And uh, uh, that may be more important than all the home runs he hit or Lou Gehrig uh, is a consecutive game streak. Uh, Gehrig films the 1937 Western Rawhide and it, yeah, the movie's totally unbelievable because Gehrig grew up in New York City. Gehrig won, goes to Columbia University. Gehrig plays with the New York Yankees. Gehrig lived in New Rochelle and Gehrig was married to Ellen uh, in at the end of his life, Ellie, at the end of his life. Anyway, uh, so the film opens with Gehrig announcing at Grand Central Terminal, he's gone. He's had it. Too much stress from baseball. He's going out to Montana. He buys a ranch in Montana with his sister, not his wife, his sister, uh, where they could relax in solitude and he could get away from the rat race. Um, and that's the whole story with Rawhide and uh, I'm not sure a medical uh, uh, somebody connected with medicine back in 1938. That's it. That's all you need to know about that movie. Oh, hey, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Uh, he replaced the teetotalers in this cartoon uh, against the gas house gorillas. And he was just an average right field heckler uh, with his carrot juice and his uh, popcorn and uh, his carrot. And he's heckling the gas house gorillas, telling them, I can beat you with one arm behind my back. And the gorillas take him up on his offer, and uh, mayhem ensues. It's a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Uh, league of their own. Uh, there is uh, Madonna jumping into Rosie O'Donnell's arms. Gina Davis is back there uh, with the catcher's uh, chest protector. Uh, Tom Hanks is also in this film. Uh, and the great line in this film, there's no crying in baseball. Um, and uh, it's a movie that uh, also made its way into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, there is the pride of the Yankees, Gary Cooper playing Lou Gehrig, and uh, Babe Ruth makes his last appearance in the movies uh, in this uh, film, Pride of the Yankees. Um, Bull Durham, Tim Robbins, Kevin Costner, Susan Sarandon, uh, about uh, life of the minor league phenom. Tim Robbins playing the pitcher based loosely on Steve Dalkowski, um, who uh, was with the Baltimore Orioles back in the day, who never made it but could throw a ball about 108 miles an hour. Ron Shelton, who wrote this movie, was his teammate in minor league baseball. And Kevin Costner, the veteran catcher, uh, who should be out of baseball by this point, or at least not be in this league, trying to mentor 
uh, a guy with a million dollar arm and a 10 cent head, Bull Durham. Uh, Jerry Lewis, when the Brooklyn Dodgers moved out to Los Angeles, which is now 64 years ago, 64th baseball season. They've been in Los Angeles longer than they played at Ebbets Field. Anyway, Jerry Lewis uh, had the Dodger players in his movie, uh, The Geisha Boy, and uh, there he is talking to Pee Wee Reese, and there is Don Zimmer behind him. Uh, Robert Redford, The Natural. You, Linda, you probably have the book in the library, The Natural. Uh, Field of Dreams, where Kevin Costner uh, is told, if you build it, uh, they will come by shoeless Joe Jackson, uh, Cornfield in Iowa. Uh, the Yankees and White Sox were supposed to play in the uh, uh, Field of uh, Dreams game last year in Iowa in the Cornfield, but COVID-19 knocked that out. They're supposed to play this year. Somebody's supposed to play this year, but we'll see if that happens. Billy Bean. Oh, Brad Pitt. Billy Bean, smartest guy in baseball. All you have to do is ask him. New York Mets first round draft pick in 1980. Uh, Billy Bean, the uh, guy who runs the Oakland A's. This is Moneyball and Michael Lewis decided to do a book, which is probably in the library, and a movie, which is probably in the library that you can take out, uh, called Moneyball, about uh, the Oakland A's. Uh, and Walter Matthau. Who never does anything, who never did anything poorly, especially when he was teamed with Jack Lemon and, oh, uh, the, the fortune cookie, odd couple, grumpy old men. Uh, no Jack Lemon in this one. Uh, this is the Bad News Bear, sponsored by Chico Bell Bonds. Uh, Major League, the two movies with Tom, uh, Charlie Sheen about uh, the Cleveland Indians. The Indians are losing the, uh, rather Cleveland's losing the Indians' uh, nickname after this year or brand name. And uh, there's me in Pittsburgh. This is in 2018. And I'm leaning against the wall. That's what's remaining of the old Forbes Field, which was the first cement stadium in Major League Baseball. And um, I have a reason that uh, this thing is in there and uh, that I'm leaning against the wall because Bing Crosby uh, bought into the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1946, the same year Bob Hope bought into the Cleveland Indians. And uh, he grew up Hope grew up in Cleveland after coming over as a child from uh, England, and uh, he survived some ownership changes to hold on to that team. Now, Crosby uh, knew that there was a film that was uh, being shot, which was called Angels in the Outfield, and he suggested, hey, let's go to Pittsburgh. I own a piece of the team. We could uh, shoot it in Pittsburgh, and they did. Uh, another comedian, uh, Danny Kaye, owned a piece of the Seattle Mariners when that team started out in 1977. Uh, these are not certainly not all the movies, but uh, a few of them. Pride of the Yankees, Bull Durham, Major League, Angels in the Outfield, Field of Dreams, Fields of Dreams, The Geisha Boy, Bad News Bears, The Natural Money Ball, and there's a whole bunch of other pictures that uh, were uh, done, including Ronald Reagan playing uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander and uh, the Grover Cleveland Alexander story. I can never figure that one out. Um, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning picture. It's of Babe Ruth, and it was taken by a guy by the name of Nat Fine in 1948. And I got to know Nat Fine when I was working at WGRC over in Nanuet. And I got to meet him one day, and he was working for Orange and Rockland Utilities, basically taking pictures of poles and down wire lines because some squirrel went on the line, bit into it, and got zapped and killed the line. Um, kind of a come down, but he needed a job. Uh, in 1948, he was with the New York Journal American, and this is Babe Ruth Day. Uh, or old timers thing. And you can see there are cameramen uh, on the first baseline at Yankee Stadium. And that, I'm 23 years old in 1979, and I'm very interested because I'm in journalism and radio and TV and newspaper. So I'm interested in talking to guys like him. And I said, uh, how'd you get that picture? And he said, just a matter of luck, really, which is really in journalism. I've had four major scoops in my life. It's all luck, just right place, right time. Anyway, so the Yankees in those days, 1948, their clubhouse was on the third base side. Their dugout was on the third base side. And all the photographers are taking pictures of a very sickly Ruth trying to get into his uniform. And that has a couple of those pictures. But that decided, I'm not going out in the field. I'm not going to take pictures, uh, the traditional pictures. 
and he said that uh, he goes, uh, he follows Babe. Uh, and Babe gets up to the top of the dugout steps and he's struggling to get there and he's leaning on his bat because he's uh, riddled with cancer and he gets out to the third baseline and that goes to the top of the dugout. He could go on the field, but he decides not to go on the field. The national anthem is being played. He takes his camera and starts shooting and he has this Pulitzer Prize winning picture of Babe Ruth. Uh, Nat, unfortunately, was out of the newspaper business by 1965 when the Journal American and the World and the Herald Tribune all merged. He was uh, making a lot of money. They decided they didn't want him anymore. And he ended up in private industry and he had a photography shop down in Piermont, New York, uh, not too far from you back in the day. But that's the background story to that as told to me by Nat Fine. Homer Simpson, Baseball Hall of Famer, yes or no? You can type it in, yes or no. Is he a Baseball Hall of Famer? 1972, the Simpsons got a whole bunch of Major League Baseball players to do voices for the softball game in the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant wins. And there's Smithers holding the championship, and there is Monty Burns, as happy as you could be, and Homer, who scored the game-winning run. I don't know who Sandy Koufax is addressing that ball to. Is it Mr. Ed or is it Wilbur Allen Young? But uh, Sandy Koufax was on Mr. Ed. Herman Munster. Uh, there he's trying out for the Los Angeles Dodgers with uh, Leo DeRocher just signing him to a contract. Leo comes out of the bushes and sees Herman uh, playing baseball with his son. They're the All-American family. Uh, and he's hitting long fly balls to uh, Eddie Wolfgang Munster. And uh, Leo is some reason there. Leo never met a morning he liked unless there was a baseball game. This is hell all night. And he signs Herman to a contract. Herman is seven foot uh, six, weighs 540 pounds, and he can't play baseball because he's hurting people. So the Dodgers release him. And um, a couple months later in the show, uh, he's playing football, kicking a football to Eddie Munster and Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, the general manager of the National Football League's Los Angeles Rams, comes out with a contract, and he could actually sign people. Leo couldn't. And he's about ready to sign Herman, and uh, Leo comes out of the woods. Yeah, don't do it, Elroy. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's how the show ends. Uh, Gilligan's Island, Jim Lefebvre and Al Ferrara visit Gilligan. Uh, Ferrara is on the right, and uh, he was a Dodger, and he said he knew he made it as a major league player when he was on one of these. Uh, Jim Lefevre was the manager of the Seattle Mariners. I was talking to him about that one day. So what were you doing on the island? So well, we were supposed to shrink Gilligan's head. We were headhunters. Uh, John Roseboro, hey, that's from Dragnet. Boom, ba bum 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 He was on Dragnet. Walter O'Malley, the Dodgers owner who moved the Brooklyn Dodgers to Los Angeles, appeared on The Rifleman uh, show, uh, actually appeared with The Rifleman star and the former Brooklyn Dodgers first baseman when O'Malley owned the team in Brooklyn in Brandon, the Goodson Todman uh, failure. It was a failure in prime time in 1965. Willie Davis acted in The Love Machine. Jerry Lewis's movie, Which Way to the Front, and The uh, Flying Nun with Sally Field. Roseboro was in Dragnet 1968, Brooks Law, Craft Suspense Theater, Mr. Ed, and Experiment in Terror. Uh, usually when I'm live, I ask, Who's, who are those guys? And most people don't know who either one of those guys are. Uh, the guy to the left is Phil Silvers, starred in the very popular CBS show, uh, in the mid-1950s, uh, which was called uh, You'll Never Get Rich, The Bilko Show, or The Phil Silver Show, depending on syndication. The guy on the right, well, he was a great home run hitter for the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League in the 1950s. He was one of these guys, his name is Steve Bilko, who was too good to play minor league baseball and not good enough to play major league baseball. But Ned Hyken, who uh, was the guy, the brains behind the uh, Bilko show and also Car 54, Where Are You, fell in love with Steve Bilko because he was a big guy. He hit a lot of home runs. He actually ate himself out of baseball. And uh, anyway, he uh, thought, hey, that's a great name for a character. So Donna Reed, Brady Bunch, Mr. Ed, The Munsters, Phil Silver's show, a.k.a. Bilko, AKA Bilko 
some of the shows that baseball players appeared on. And then there's this guy from the Bronx, Moose Steubing, who would be 89 years old now, born in 1932 in the Bronx. Moose Steubing was the manager of the Anaheim Angels in the late 1980s. Steubing, name sound familiar? It might, because Steubing was the name of the captain on the love boat, Gavin McLeod playing Merrill Steubing. So how did Moose Steubing become Merrill Steubing? Well, Aaron Spelling, who was the, uh, who, who called, this, he called himself the King of Schlock, he had Charlie's Angels, he had Dynasty, he had Love Boat, he had uh, The Pain, The Pain, uh, Fantasy Island, had all those shows on. Uh, anyway, he used to get his characters by looking up in the baseball encyclopedia and looking at names and names and names and names. And he stumbles on Steuben and he says, that's it. That's who I'm going to name my love boat captain after. I asked Moose Steuben, you ever get any royalties from spelling? He said, no, no, but I know it's me. Uh, John Forsythe, who was on uh, one of Aaron Spelling's shows, Dynasty, uh, landed his first paying job at the ballpark as the announcer for the Brooklyn Dodgers after college in the 1950s. He would later star in one of Spelling's biggest hits, Dynasty, in the 1980s. And to show how he came full circle, there he is with Jack Lemmon uh, with the Hollywood All-Stars, uh, raising money for some charity uh, and the All-Stars, the movie stars. There's Forsyth on the right, and on the left is Jack Lemmon, who in The Odd Couple played Felix Unger in the movie, 1968. And uh, there's a scene at Shea Stadium. And Oscar Madison, the sports writer, of course, is covering the game for whatever newspaper he's working for. And there's a phone call to the press box. I know where the phones are at Shea Stadium. I know exactly where they were. And uh, anyway, so uh, it's, they say, hey, Madison's for you. And he walks over and gets on the phone, and his back is turned to the play. And Bill Mazeroski of the Pittsburgh Pirates hits into a triple play. And uh, Felix wanted to know what Oscar wanted for dinner, and mayhem ensued on that show, uh, in that movie. Uh, Jack Lemmon, who um, interrupted Oscar Madison or Walter Matthau uh, in the baseball part of that movie, Baseball and the Culture. And there's, uh, oh, there's Mr. Baseball, must be in the front row, Bob Euchre. Uh, I've known Uke for 40 years. Uh, he's still out in Milwaukee. He's going to be doing some Milwaukee Brewers home games this year. He was a catcher with uh, the Milwaukee Braves, a hometown guy who signed with his team. Uh, and then he's traded to Philadelphia and St. Louis, and he ends up in Atlanta. And then after his career, he's a community relations guy with the Atlanta Braves. And he's also an aspiring comedian. So he's going around clubs in the South. And when the trumpet player, Al Hurt, walks into a club, he sees Euchre, and he thinks he's absolutely hysterical. And he calls Johnny Carson. He says, hey, I just saw this. you got to have him on the show, this guy, Bob Euchre. He's, he's hilarious. And the Carson people get a hold of Euchre. He does his routine, Johnny invites him to the desk, and if you were a comedian, there was no higher honor in the world than Johnny inviting you to his desk and sitting next to him, because that means you've made it. I know a guy by the name of Wayne Cotter, who's about 63 years old now, who said uh, he was banging around South Jersey and Philadelphia and took nine years, and he ended up on the Carson Show, and Johnny invited him to sit, and sometimes he'd be on the show because Johnny just wanted to talk to him, didn't have to do a routine. Uh, in the break, Carson leaned over and said, uh, hey, Bob, um, they tell me you're a baseball player. Were you a baseball player? So I have one of these, a baseball card, so I must be. Uh, Broadway, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. This is Damn Yankees back in the 1950s, and uh, Joe Hardy sells his soul to the devil. And um, it was Washington. Washington had won. Uh, they were in the World Series in 1933. Uh, but uh, somebody, they were, you know, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League. They did win a World Series in 2019. They were chasing the Yankees, chasing the Yankees, chasing the Yankees. Joe Hardy sells his soul to the devil in an attempt to, uh, for Washington to win a championship. Damn Yankees, Joe Hardy. And the other big song, You Gotta Have Heart. And these guys have heart. They win the 1969 World Series, and there is 
Ed, the old sports writer, the old sports writer, Ed Sullivan, and uh, my cousin, Jerry Stiller, and his wife, Ann Mira, were on his show 36 times. And on my TV talk, I talk about all the motions and all this, 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 and this. Uh, but he was really happy because he got the New York Mets, and Ed really liked jocks. And the Mets sing on that show in 1969 after winning the 1969 World Series. You gotta have heart. And there's Cousin Jerry with my two kids back in 1994. And this is a perfect segue from Jerry Stiller and Ed Sullivan to Jerry Stiller on the Seinfeld Show. Jerry Stiller played Frank Costanza. And some of that acting on that show actually probably wasn't acting. That was my family, screaming, yelling, and everything else. Uh, and I once said to Jerry, how much is that acting and how much of it is our family? And he laughed and I knew the answer. But anyway, uh, Jerry is involved in, the, in a funny bit on one of the George Steinbrenner shows. Uh, George suggested storylines. He became buddies with uh, Larry David and he would call in storylines and tell the story and Larry would translate it into a script. And three of them I picked out, Missing George, Board Meeting Moved in Different Uniforms. The Missing George one, happened in Tampa, and they were all based on true stories. George was uh, running American Shipbuilding in Tampa, and he used to get to the office about six in the morning before anybody else did, and he knew every employee. He didn't treat his employees in American Ship like he did with the Yankees. And uh, he, there was this one guy who George was uh, really worried about who uh, he thought might get in trouble one day because George thought he was kind of hanging out with guys he shouldn't be hanging out with. And uh, so it's Friday. And George leaves, and uh, the guy apparently leaves. So it's Monday morning. George comes back to the office at 6 o'clock, and this guy's car is there. And George has never seen this guy's car being there at 6 in the morning, and he begins to get nervous. He walks in the office. The guy is not there. He calls the Tampa police, all points bulletin to find this guy. This guy just walks in later on in the day, said, just went away from the weekend with my friend. Well, George is relieved. But George sends that into um, – uh, Larry David, and he says, let's make a baseball story out of it, and he does, and uh, it involves uh, George Costanza, played by Jason Alexander, who is the assistant traveling secretary of the New York Yankees, a job that doesn't exist, but did in, in Seinfeld, and um, same thing, the car is there, uh, George gets worried, what happened, what happened, what happened, he's not back, and they go to Jerry, uh, rather to Frank Costanza's apartment. They knock on the door. It's George with some other guy. And he says, Mr. Costanza, Mr. Costanza, uh, we think that George is dead. And Jerry Stiller looks at him for a second. You traded Jay Buner for Ken Phelps? You traded Kate? That was all George. Uh, board meeting moved. And one thing, if you knew about George, uh, was this, because I dealt with him. Uh, if he saw food on your plate that he liked, it was his food too. And uh, one day, somebody brought in a cannoli, uh, Calzon, you know, to the, the uh, Yankee Stadium meeting, and George said, uh, what's that? You know, food. And they picked up the entire meeting, and they go to the place near Yankee Stadium. They made a show out of that. Different uniforms. Uh, the Tampa Yankees of the Florida State League. No more Florida State League. The league names have been retired in the restructuring of baseball. Anyway, uh, he has the Tampa Yankees, and they try different uniforms. They shrink, but it becomes a show on Seinfeld. Uh, he actually did try out uh, for a Seinfeld show, and you go up on YouTube, and you'll see the uh, clip, and you'll understand why George Steinbrenner was not on the show, because he thought he was Olivier. Um, Seinfeld was quoted. He actually did a scene in the show and it was terrible. We couldn't use it. We cut him out. It wasn't funny. They were expecting Buffoon George. And yeah, I knew Buffoon George and I knew Serious George and I knew all kinds. Of, George was like 14 different people. Uh, he wasn't funny. And I don't remember exactly what went wrong with it, but it was quite an awkward situation. And uh, Keith Hernandez was on the Seinfeld show. He's dating Elaine. He has to break up with Elaine because he's smoking. Uh, and part of the show also is George Costanza is jealous of Keith because he's getting Jerry's attention. And George's best friend is supposed to be Jerry. By the way, Keith didn't know who Jerry Seinfeld was. 
And as you know, I've met fans now that Keith and Jerry are pretty tight. Uh, Scott Boris, uh, Keith's agent after he was retired, said, uh, hey, Jerry, watch on Seinfeld. And he said, what's that? And Boris said, well, they'll fly you out first class. They'll put you up in a hotel for a week, pay you 15 grand. And Keith said, oh, Jerry and I are old buddies. Yeah, right. Anyway, Keith Hernandez was on that show. Oh, by the way, George Steinbrenner once hosted Saturday Night Live. Great parody of George on that show. He played every position for the New York Yankees. And, oh, you remember this guy? Baseball been very, very good to me. Chico Esquela, played by Garrett Morris back in the 1970s. I was going to cut this out. <coughs> Excuse me for a second. I was going to cut this out. Because who, who knows Wally Pitt these days? But I was watching Jeopardy last September, season 37, show number one. And there was a question or an answer. Uh, who was Wally Pitt was the, uh, was the question that you have to get back to the answer to. Uh, and Wally Pitt lost his job to Lou Gehrig, June 2nd, 1925. And Lou Gehrig never missed another game until he was sidelined in 1939. Uh, the myth? He lost his job to Gehrig because of a headache. He was beaned. He was hit in the head while he pipped a few days earlier. And the, the moral of the story, don't call it sick because someone else will do your job and they may do it better. And uh, when I was around in the 1970s looking for a job, we, we still heard, well, hey, he was Wally Pip. Wally was the answer to a Jeopardy question. Season 37, show one. Opening day of this year's Jeopardy. Cigarettes were a big deal, big, big deal in baseball. Here's Babe Ruth in the blindfold test. If you look really closely at your monitor, it looks like Babe is sitting on old Sparky and Sing Sing and they're about ready to flip the switch, the last cigarette, and the blindfold on, and good knowing you, Babe. Uh, Babe Ruth in the blindfold cigarette test. The old gold's mildness and smoothness marked it right off the bat as the best. Now the cough in the car load. Hey, Chesterfield, always buy Chesterfield. And you old uh, New York Giants fans, uh, remember the scoreboard, ABC, in the polo grounds. That was became Rheingold beer when the Mets were there. Ted Williams smoked it. Uh, well, he held the pack. Sam Usual looked like somebody knocked down the tooth and just stuck a cigarette in there. DiMaggio, guarantee you he didn't pay for that cigarette. Yule Blackwell, Bucky Harris, the uh, manager of the 1947 world champion in Yankees, and Bob Elliott, the left fielder of the Boston Braves. ABC, always by Chesterfield, the baseball man cigarette. Oh, Yogi, 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 first Yogi story. Uh, you know, Joe Gargiola was his best friend growing up uh, from Dago Hill in the Bronx, and uh, I say that because that's what they called it. It's now just known as the Hill in St. Louis. And, uh, but that's what they called it. And Joe said to me about Yogi and his business acumen, when Yogi steps in it, he steps in it. And um, so Yogi's got Yoohoo. And here's an advertisement for Yoohoo with uh, Yogi and Mickey. I don't know if there was Yoohoo in that bottle. Moose Gowron, who was one of my favorite people to interview. Really, really nice guy. Baseball career saved by Casey Stengel, who sent him to Arthur Murray Dance School so he can learn footwork to play first base for the Yankees. And uh, Elston Howard, the drink of champions, you who Now, I thought this was vile. I mean, I, I had it. It was chocolate mixed with water. I thought it was vile. But let's get back to Garagiola, how Yogi steps in it. Uh, Yogi's at a country club in New Jersey in 1955, and he meets the Oliveri family who put this thing together, and they're saying, you know, we can't get this brand uh, on the supermarket shelves, just can't do it. Um, and you want to try it, Yogi? And Yogi tries it, and the Oliveris are like, oh, okay, let's try it, let's see what he thinks. And uh, he says, yeah, I like it. How'd you like a position on the board? You got a position on the board. Guess what? You who's on the supermarket shelves all of a sudden because Yogi's drinking it. Uh, here's a quote that uh, Dave Kaplan, and maybe in one of the books, uh, you probably have Dave's books with Yogi in a library. Uh, one time, and this is um, from Dave, who, who wrote the book, like a couple of the books. Uh, one of them is, uh, I think, called, I didn't say what they said I said. Anyway, one time I was in the office and the phone rang when no one else was around. I always answer a ringing phone, so I did. Uh, the woman who was calling asked if you who was hyphenated. I said, no, ma'am, it's not even carbonated. 
hey, Yogi, Yogi sold you uh, Kraft Italian dressing. For me, it's got everything. Sure makes swell salads. Oh, and I'm old enough where I had a car with a battery that I had to put water in the battery in 1966 uh, Chevrolet uh, Capri station wagon. Anyway, Yogi Berra says, I add water only three times a year. My car I used in 1973. Uh, Prestolite, high level battery, needs water only three times a year. Three times a year. Yogi was happy about that. Oh, he also sold Miller Lite uh, back in the uh, 1980s. Um, you know, I, with Mark Thromberry, was also in that series of commercials. I don't know why they have me here. Uh, and Yogi, hey, for Christmas, get a Shelby bike. Yogi says, this Christmas, ask mom and dad for a Shelby bike, the winner's bike. Um, uh, it's time for another Yogi story. Uh, TV, he was on the Bilko Show. Uh, back in the 1950s, he and about four other Yankees uh, were on the show. And I decided to uh, talk to him about being on the Bilko show, the Phil Silver show. And I said, hey, you know, what were New York Yankees players in uh, Fort ba at Fort Baxter in Kansas, which is where this show allegedly took place? He said, no, we're in the Bronx. I said, yeah, I know. It was shot at the, th at the studio in the Bronx. But what was the pretext that the Yankees were there? He said, well, we went to the Bronx. You know, I left my house in Montclair, went on the turnpike, went across the bridge, and, and we went on the Bronx, uh, uh, across Bronx, uh, and, and we got off, and that's where it was. And at that point, I said, you know what? This is not going anywhere. You're right, Yogi. It was in the Bronx. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, guarantee you he didn't pay for that drink, that cigarette, or whatever else that uh, they were serving him in Maryland at the Stork Club uh, in 1954 or so. On January 14th, 1954, Joe D. and Marilyn eloped in San Francisco. About 10 months later, Marilyn files for divorce, citing only mental cruelty, although I've been told by people it was more than just that because of this. This is Stanford, Connecticut. This is the summer of 2017. I speak up in Stanford, Connecticut at a bunch of places. Uh, non-COVID time. And uh, every summer there's artwork in the middle of Stanford, Connecticut. And um, every summer um, they come up with this incredible artwork, street work. And this year they came up with 26 foot Marilyn Monroe. Uh, by the way, behind Marilyn with her skirt up uh, is the Congregational Church. And when you walked out of that place, the first thing you saw was Marilyn's skirt was up which did not make the parnishioners, parnishioners, churchgoers, uh, very happy to see that. Uh, to the right of Marilyn and the right of me is another church, and you open the door and you saw her halter top. But uh, Joe D. saw the skirt come up in the scene of the seven-year itch as they were filming it, and... Uh, there was something happened that night. Like I said, I've heard stories. Whether they're true or not, I don't know. But uh, virtually the next day, Marilyn filed for divorce, citing mental cruelty. Joe DiMaggio and song. Mrs. Robinson, who you pro that you've probably heard that song 30,000 times. In fact, Paul Simon, that was announced, sold his music off to some major publishing company. So his heirs will get money. Uh, that money now, as opposed to after he passes away and paying uh, major taxes on it. That just happened the last day or two. Uh, that song started out as Mrs. Robinson. We didn't start the fire, the Billy Joel song. Joe, Joe is in there. Joe, Joe uh, from 1941. Joe, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, other songs, did you see Jackie Hit the Ball by Duke Ellington and Mickey by Teresa Brewer? Teresa Brewer. Um, let's talk about Mrs. Robinson. Uh, which started out as just a snatch in the movie of The Graduate. Of the dit, 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 dit. Um, and Paul Simon was told by Mike Nichols and others, hey, you know what, that's pretty catchy. Why don't you try to flush it out and see, you might have a hit song with it. So he does. And he's looking around and looking around. And uh, he decides to call it Mrs. Roosevelt after Eleanor Roosevelt. And Mike Nichols hears it. And he says, no, it's Mrs. Robinson now. And it becomes Mrs. Robinson. Um, the old timers, Johnny Blanchard and Tommy Tresh and those guys told me, and they all had the same story, told me about the meeting between Joe DiMaggio and Paul Simon 
in some Manhattan restaurants after the song came out. And Joe goes to the table, Paul goes to, whoever goes to the table, they go to the table, they shake hands. And uh, Joe says, what do you mean? Where have I gone? I'm not, I'm here, I'm here with you. I did a commercial last week. I'm all over the place. I haven't gone anywhere. I am here. And Paul Simon says, well, no, you know, Joe, uh, you left when I was 10 years old. I was a Yankee fan. The last time you played was in 1951. I never saw you again. So, you know, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? And I was looking for a hero. And there is uh, the sleeve for the uh, old, uh, the Mrs. Robinson old friends slash bookends uh, 45, when we could get 45s, remember those? Uh, I said, I didn't mean it literally. He said to him, I didn't mean it literally. He said, I was thinking of people who were heroes. Eleanor Roosevelt, I thought of her. I thought of Ted Williams. Uh, these were real heroes. And I came to you because you were my hero. And you left. You weren't around anymore. Well, that's what the old timers told me. Paul Simon was on the Dick Cabot show. And he told the story. Uh, I said I didn't mean the lines literally. That I thought of him as an American hero and that general, genuine heroes were in short supply. He accepted the explanation. He thanked me with shook hands and said good night. Uh, Paul probably paid for the dinner because, as Phil Rizzuto said, Joe never paid for anything. Um, and Joe accepted that. But there was another guy who was around who did not particularly accept that, uh, accept that explanation. Uh, his name was Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle once went up to Paul Simon and said, why'd you use him instead of me? Because DiMaggio hated Mantle and Mantle hated DiMaggio. DiMaggio would look to his left and he'd see this beautiful blonde man, uh, chiseled. His name was Mantle out of the earth and he was an old man. That was, a ready, that was ready to die as a baseball player at the age of 37. Um, and Mickey blamed Joe for his knee injury because Mickey thought that Joe loafed on the ball. Hit to right center field in 1951 during the World Series against the Giants. Trips over a sprinkler and wrecks his knee. And the two of them didn't like one another. Uh, and and uh, Paul says, Paul Simon says to Mickey, you know, Mickey Mantle doesn't sound as good as Joe DiMaggio in the song. So Dick Cavett knew the background that Mantle and Joe D hated one another. And uh, he brought it up to Paul Simon. And Paul said, it's all about syllables, Dick. It's about how many beats there are. That's Terry Cashman. He and I share the same periodontist in Riverdale. Uh, and uh, he was the baseball balladeer in the 1980s. And uh, he wrote a song called Willie Mickey and the Duke Talking Baseball. And there is Duke Snyder, and there is the Invisible Man, and there is Willie Mays, and there is Mickey Mantle, because the four of them were walking in old timers day at Shea Stadium back uh, in the 1970s. And uh, Joe D is airbrushed out of the uh, record sleeve because Terry Cashman does not mention him in the record. And DiMaggio went up to Terry Cashman and said, why am I not there? And Terry, who was born in 1940, said, well, uh, I was talking about the guys who I really watched growing up uh, and uh, from a different era. And uh, Joe agreed. He was okay with that. He was cool. Uh, and there's the scooter, Phil Rizzuto. And I can tell you stories about him for the next half hour, but I'm just going to tell you one story. Um, he is the only baseball Hall of Famer who has a gold record. Meatloaf, 1978, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Meatloaf lived near me, so we got to talking about this one day. And um, he was saying, we wanted Rizzuto. We mean him and Jim Steinman, uh, who wrote the music. And we wanted Rizzuto because we thought he'd be perfect for the song, that Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And so we contact Phil, and we get him in the recording studio. And he thinks he's some sort of star. He's not being Phil Rizzuto takes about 120 takes to get to what we wanted, which is him sounding like Phil Rizzuto. And uh, if you don't know what the, story, the song is, uh, well, it's not exactly a baseball song, but Rizzuto pr provides the play-by-play -play of a player's aggressive base running, and he gets caught out, nearly called out a couple times, and eventually he tries for home on the suicide squeeze, and he makes it. Well, the song is about young love. And it's about young love in a car, a uh, driving movie, perhaps. And uh, Scooter's kids who were going to school at the time this record came out around 1978, they were in college in the Boston area, said, hey, Dad, you know what that song was about? It's about sex. And Huckleberry, he fooled me. 
Scooter claimed he never knew it was about that until his kids told him. Baseball cards, baseball cards, baseball cards. I know some of you have baseball cards. Now, the baseball cards uh, have come back into vogue, sort of, with older people. You used to be able to get them at candy stores and things like that, and those, you know, five cents, five cards. You got a um, piece of bubble gum, and the bubble gum was like this hard, and a bit into it, and broke your teeth. That's why I have a periodontist. Um, but, you know, the baseball card was a really cool thing because the baseball card could teach you how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide uh, if you want averages and all that. But more importantly, more importantly, uh, it gave you a business sense and it was your entree into gambling because you did that, or you did that, and you did that. You were gambling cards away. I bet you didn't know it. That was your entree to Atlantic City. The other thing is, when I said business sense, um, you held back some cards, you wanted to trade for other cards, and you tried old-fashioned trading back and forth. And uh, geography, who's on this baseball card? What to say? Well, this is the Mets. Uh, but if you look uh, at, um, well, let's say Oakland. Oakland is on the card here. It says Oakland, so you could look it up, and there it is. And if you had a bicycle and you had clothespins, put the clothespins in the flaps, you had the, the uh, cards and the flaps, and they had that ooh, whooshing sound that sounded so cool. Baseball cards. Kids today don't collect baseball cards. Nor are there any new songs, no new literature, no Ernest Hemingway and uh, Old Man in the Sea and the Great DiMaggio, which brings another Yogi story up. Uh, Dave Kaplan is telling me this story. It's in one of the books, and uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, comes to uh, see a Yankees game, and they bring him down to the Yankees clubhouse after the game, and it's, he meets all the players. And, you know, Ernest Hemingway, Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle, Ernest Hemingway, pleasure to meet you, pleasure to meet you, all that, and comes up to Yogi. And Ernest Hemingway, Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, Ernest Hemingway. Yogi puts out his hand, and he says, what paper you write for, Ernie? Kansas City Star. No real new baseball movies, you know, classic baseball movies. Maybe Moneyball is the last one. Just another sport. Oh, and yes, Hermes Simpson is in Baseball's Hall of Fame. There was a display of him in 2017. Um, he's in with Casey at the bat. Uh, John Fogarty's record, uh, the uh, single, uh, Center Field in 1985, the movie League of Their Own, and of course, Who's on First. That guy there, Joe Namath. Bruce Morton and I interviewing him back in 1988, cemented the Super Bowl as a must-see, top, top-of-notch, top-of-the-line uh, sports event of all time in the United States when the Jets beat the Colts 16-7 on January 12th, 1969. But uh, by that point, football had surpassed baseball as the most popular sport in America. 1950, it was baseball, horse racing, and boxing that dominated the American sports scene. Uh, there's Man Ali in 1985. He couldn't say boxing. Boxing has gone downhill. And uh, horse racing has been saved by casinos uh, inside of uh, racetracks. Jim Bounton, that's me and Jim Bounton at the Yogi Berra Museum, 2007. Uh, we crisscrossed a lot, but we were never on the same dais together. Uh, he wrote probably the quintessential baseball book, Ball Four, which I'm sure you have in the library. Humanized Players, one of the 20 most influential books of the 20th century, according to the New York Public Library. In 1970, the baseball commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, uh, told uh, Bounton uh, that, uh, hey, you know what? Say it, you made up all this stuff. I didn't make up all this stuff. Uh, baseball was embarrassed by the book, which humanized players. The book was also used as part of the arbitration when Peter Seitz ended the baseball reserve clause in 1975. Soccer. Soccer gets better ratings on TV than baseball among young people. That's me on the red carpet in 2015 down in Philadelphia. I am in that movie, Sons of Ben. Soccer movie. Ain't over until it's over, right? Ain't over until it's over. You know, when you see a fork in the road, take it. Uh, nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. Uh, it gets uh, late. It gets, it gets early. Late. Oh, no, it gets late early out there. Uh, the left field uh, shadows in Yankee Stadium. Um, some of the others, the future ain't what it used to be. 
and uh, hey, you better go to that guy's funeral because he's not going to yours uh, if you don't. Anyway, um, Mike Dyer, sports writer, Long Island Press, 1973. Gets Yogi to say his most famous say. And if you're expecting a big story, you're going to be disappointed. There's no big story here. 1973, some of you might remember the New York Mets uh, had a lot of injuries. Seaver was out, Grody was out, a whole bunch of players were out. And Yogi's the manager. And uh, somehow uh, his team is hanging in there. Chicago's not running away with it. Pittsburgh's not running away with it. Um, and, and so Yogi's team's competitive. But their margin of error is very small. They can't really lose ten, too many more games or it's over. And Mike Dyer, writing for the Long Island Press, is in the manager's room at Shea Stadium. It's a desk and these guys crowd around. And Mike says uh, to Yogi, is it over? And Yogi said, it ain't over till it's over. Most famous saying. Not much of a story there. It is over. And that's the last time that I saw Yogi. That was in uh, June of 2011 down the museum. Along with Brian Cashman, uh, we were giving talks that day to uh, a bunch of high school students who were looking to get into journalism or baseball or whatever. And that is my last picture with Yogi back in 2011. Ain't over until it's over, but it's over. Thank you, Linda, so much for inviting me. I will open it up for questions or comments or criticisms or your remembrances. Thank you. It was. It was a great trip down memory lane. And if anybody wants to unmute themselves or say something in the chat, I'm sure people have their own special memories. Abbott and Costello is was one of my favorites. But anybody want to share anything or um, going down memory lane? Was this taped so we could watch it again? Yes, yes, I will. I, we will put it up into the uh, Upper Side River Library's YouTube page. It'll probably take it with this being a longer weekend. We probably won't get around to it till about Monday, but I'll send out an email. Thank you. Can I, ask a question? I have a question. Yeah. If, yeah. Um, with respect to, I guess, diminishing popularity in comparison to other sports, do you think the, um, the drug and the, the steroid crises and, and all the ugliness around that had an impact on that or no howard cosell used to say and I, i'm still friendly with his uh, three three of his grandsons uh colin who's the mets pa announcer uh justin who's a charter school principal and jared who's a lawyer for uh, espn used to say baseball's problem it's a 19th century game stuck in the moving 20th century it's slow it is really, really so. I shouldn't say that because it's about the same as a football game. Uh, but, you know, there seems to be more action in the football game, which isn't true. Uh, but it, they've marketed themselves so, so poorly. That, that's the big problem. I mean, they survived the cocaine scandal in the 1980s. Um, they've survived um, uh, collusion um, and, and you know so what do they do to increase the popularity of the game this year? They cut the minor leagues. They cut the New York Penn League. You know uh, Oneonta and, and I know they got rid of Sussex a long time ago but they cut 42 teams. 42 opportunities for people to go out and watch a baseball game and, and pay for what you would be a price of a movie to get entertained and yeah, you know, they they have no forward thinking, and it's been that way for so 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 long. I mean, um, they just you know they're stuck in this pastoral game of the 19th century, uh, and kids you know kids have this today. They watch things on on that, and it's bang bang bang. You know you you don't have albums anymore, right? You know uh, albums. And they, and then Cosell once said of Tim McCarver, and he's absolutely right. How many times can you uh, overanalyze a two hopper to the second baseman? Um, baseball's coming back on radio. Um, the announcers, every city, the announcer was your friend. Bob Prince in Pittsburgh, Vinny out in Los Angeles, Mel Allen here in New York, and Scooter and all. 
And they're nondescript generic announcers now who don't tell stories. And players used to be colorful, and they're not colorful anymore. Um, it's like the firm now. It's, it's just, okay, we're out there. And, you know, okay, let's have some fun flipping a bat. Okay, but you can't do that. The traditionalists claim you can't do that. Hey, Jimmy Pearsall used to play center field with bug spray in his back pocket and occasionally would go for a fly ball and there'd be bugs around. He'd catch fly ball with his left hand and spray bug spray with his right hand. Um, yeah, they don't have characters anymore, but they're dissuaded from having characters too. There was a question in the chat about any- Yeah, that Mickey Mantle. Um, I got to be careful here because I could blow his image. I don't have any good stories about Mick. Uh, my dealings with Mick were not very good. In fact, they were terrible. However, I will say this about Mick. Um, well, I guess these are stories. Um, when the Baseball Players Association in 1968 was moving ahead and really getting behind Marvin Miller, uh, there was a big meeting at the Sheridan um, on 7th Avenue, and uh, there were about 300 players there, and Mickey was showing up. Mickey hadn't announced his retirement yet, but was going to announce his retirement, and uh, Marvin Miller, who ran the Baseball Players Association, we are talking about that years later, and uh, Marvin said, I didn't know, I really didn't know what to expect from Mickey, whether he's going to support me or not. His yeah, relatives were beaten up in the Oklahoma coal mines, and he was abused as a kid, and which was a major problem in his life. Um, so he gets on the podium, and he's walking towards me. I don't know what he's doing. Um, and he comes over, he puts his arm around me, and Marvin was like 5'7". Uh, and it's a slight guy, and Mickey, of course. And um, he says, Partner, anything you want, you got it. And all the players stood up and gave him an ovation. Apparently, he was the ultimate teammate. Uh, the players liked him. Tommy Tresh uh, named one of his kids Mickey. It was somebody else who named one of his kids Mickey. Bobby Richardson uh, spoke at uh, his eulogy or, or gave his eulogy at uh, his funeral. He was beloved by his teammates. And uh, when he was on, see, I could tell you stories, but I don't know if you want an X-rated version of this or not. Well, probably not. Uh, but he took care of his teammates uh, after his career. He'd go on the uh, baseball card tour. And whatever city that he went in, if he had a former teammate that was in that city, he'd invite him to sign autographs. And you, if you went to the Mickey Mantle baseball, you also had to uh, buy a Tom Sturdivant baseball or a Tommy Tresh baseball. Uh, some players loved him. They thought he was the greatest thing going. As far as us in the media and outsiders, um, he was not a nice guy to us. Uh, Yogi was a nice guy. Whitey Ford was a really nice guy. Um, Hank Bauer, Lou Scour, they were all nice guys. But uh, I can tell you one story about Mickey. Uh, Mickey and Joe hated one another. And Steinbrenner gave him $125,000 each to appear at Old Timers game. Uh, and uh, there was a fight, some sort of fight, because DiMaggio and Mickey wanted to be the last ones introduced. Um, and it was Joe. I mean, Joe had it in his contract that he had to be wherever he went. Uh, America is uh, baseball's greatest living player. He had to have that in his contract. And so Joe would be the last one to be uh, introduced. And Mickey didn't like that. Mickey hated it. And uh, I know there was one Friday night where Mickey was told it's going to be him again. And he just uh, has a couple of drinks, flies back to Dallas, and doesn't tell anybody he flew back to Dallas. And where I sat in Yankee Stadium in the radio area was next to Steinbrenner's box. So I get to see George in action occasionally. And um, Steinbrenner was irate, irate that day that Mickey stiffed him. Uh, and I think he read the riot act to Mickey after that, although he read the riot act many times to Mickey because Mickey embarrassed him quite a few times. But uh, I could tell that story. Um, yeah, that was Mickey. Um, and Mickey, after you know his liver transplant, tried to be nice to people in the very short time that he had left. Uh, it was Pat Summerall who sent, uh, who got Mickey into, uh, it was uh, Mickey who got Pat Summerall into Betty Ford. Who's worried about his friend's alcoholism. So they ran in those circles.
probably not the pleasant story you want to hear about Mickey, but it's a story about Mickey. Story of the time. Any other questions do people have? Or, well, I think, with, oh, yes. Do you think guys like Clemens are ever going to make it into the Hall of Fame? Uh, I have a problem with the Hall of Fame as a journalist, <laughs> okay? Uh, all right, I'll get into this. First of all, as a journalist, you never should vote on an award for somebody who you could potentially interview. And the Baseball Writers Association of America is in charge of this voting, although there are other committees as well. And I could tell you stories. Maury Allen, who is a really, really nice guy, uh, worked for the New York Post, and he was a writer. And we were talking one day about Willie McCovey, who was one of the great players uh, of the 1960s. And Maury told me it was very difficult for him to vote for Willie to get to the Hall of Fame because Willie, post-game, after games, would look down at his shoes while doing an interview with 12 guys hanging on top of you. And he looked down on the shoes. He said he was cold and he was distant, like Candlestick Park. And this is some of the criteria that writers use uh, to vote for the Hall of Fame. Now, I, like I said, I'm a journalist. I don't vote for anything. I mean, I, people send me things to vote. Um, and I don't. And the New York Times doesn't allow you to do so. And the Atlanta Journal of Constitution doesn't allow you to do so. And I don't think the Washington Post does either. But all the other papers do, what's left of the papers. And I think it should be the baseball geeks. Um, and, you know, look, uh, there was a time where these guys probably did steroids, except it's never been proven. It's never been proven that these guys did take steroids. Uh, there weren't any tests uh, that were done. Now, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. I spoke at the George H.W. Uh, Bush Presidential Library uh, back in 2007, and um, one of the things that George H.W. Bush did in 1990 was sign the uh, Controlled Substance Act into law, which took effect in 1991, which basically made steroids illegal unless a physician uh, gave it to you. And uh, so where did these guys get the steroids? And also when McGuire was busted, he wasn't using steroids. He was using a, um, a supplement that you could buy at G uh, GNC that was a uh, precursor to steroids. So this is a very, very, very entangled area. Um, and the only people that have been busted for steroids in sports been done so for, um, not for possession of steroids, but for mail fraud, for mailing the steroids. Um, so uh, it's, it's such a tricky question that, um, you know, you can't, I, I don't think that Bonds and Clemens and Rodriguez will make it now. I think when everybody's dead and gone, 75 years from now, everybody will look back and say, well, you know what? A lot of players used it at that time. And so we got to judge them against the other players because steroids didn't make everybody great. Um, because if, uh, the estimate was 80% of the players at that point were doing something. And uh, not everybody was great. Um, so, you know, who knows? Uh, I wouldn't trust this brand of sports writers. And I, I can tell you stories about sports writers. Uh, I told you one about Maury Allen. I, I think that the geeks, the real geeks, the saber heads and the seam heads, they're the ones who should be voting on the Hall of Fame because they actually take it to heart, whereas writers, you know, you know they, they do whatever they do, I suppose. They think they're the guardians of the game, but they're not. Probably got me in trouble with a whole bunch of people. No. <laughs> what I just did, but that's the way I feel. And you know what? Those guys know the way I feel. And like Bill Madden, the Daily News, never comes near me. Never comes near me. Because uh, he knows what I think. There's a lot of evidence. There's a good amount of evidence. No. Yeah, but it, it, there, is ev there is kind of evidence, there but it's, it's not admissible in court. And no. given that it's illegal, these guys should have been turned in. And these guys, I'll tell you, McGuire and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Jose Canseco, they knew, baseball knew what was going on with them. And the feds knew what was going on with them and they ignored them because they wanted to get the distributors, which they never did. Hey, Pete Rose had uh, what the guy Jansen who gave him some stuff 
uh, with the gambling stuff, and he was also his personal trainer. Uh, and Pete might have, uh, you know, you could say the thing about same thing about Pete. Um, you would never know who's clean. I, I think clean. it's what you said too. It's a it's a thorny issue that um, will be debated for a, a long a long time because until you literally see somebody do it and give them the proof, they won't know. Well, you had the IRS. Well, the IRS. I got they got Radomski, then they got McNamee, yeah. and they had a lot of evidence. Yeah, but except nobody got caught. So, do we have, have any other topics? It it's getting sure. to be about eight thirty. I hate to interrupt this, but it is getting to be past eight thirty. So, I, I I don't know if anybody else has a question that they want to ask at this point, or to let Evan go for her, the one hour lecture that he goes as we're going on. I got, I got two more tomorrow, so. Um, <laughs> got two more, I'm off on Saturday. I got one on Sunday. I think I got two on Monday. Oh. So, um, yeah, busy, but it's good. I don't, you know, six, it's six seconds to my bed. <laughs> I think that, 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 again, that is the beauty of it. Yep. Well, I, I'm gonna stop with the recording up, start with the recording.